tuning in, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Well, today we're going to take a little break from our Scripture and Science class series, and I have an interview for you that I think you'll be really interested in, and then next week we'll get back to that class and explore a little bit more about reading Genesis 1 and all the different options for that. But today I'd like to begin with the question, have you heard of the Gospel of Thomas? What about the Gospel of Philip or Judas? Although most Christians are only familiar with the four Gospels contained in the Bible, ancient Christians wrote quite a few other Gospels as well. How do we know which Gospels are to be trusted? Most of us would say, well, it's in the Bible, so I trust it, and that settles it. Well, who's to say that the people that decided what books go in the Bible got it right? What other criteria could we use to determine which Gospels are most reliable, do most conform to the early Christian proclamation? My guest today is Dr. Simon Gathercole, professor of New Testament and Early Christianity at the University of Cambridge. His book, The Gospel and the Gospels, puts forward a common sense historical methodology to determine which Gospels are most reliable. Here now is episode 461, The Gospel and the Gospels, with Simon Gathercole. Welcome to Restitutio, Simon Gathercole. I'm glad to talk with you today about your recent book, The Gospel and the Gospels. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Uh, So you studied New Testament. Well, you are the professor of New Testament and early Christianity at the University of Cambridge, and you have degrees from Cambridge as well as Durham University, where you studied under James Dunn, the famous James Dunn. And I'm just curious, before we get into talking about the book a little bit more, what was that like studying under him? It it was great. We didn't completely see eye to eye on the topic that I wrote my thesis on, but he was very caring and loved. He also loved a good argument, but didn't take didn't take it personally. So when we disagreed, he, you know, he was he was totally happy about that. So uh, we got on very very well, and um, and continue to get on very well until he sadly died a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. Today we're talking about your book. And in particular, I was thinking, this, this is a big book that you've written here. <laughs> 576 pages, hundreds of footnotes. I don't even know how many footnotes. And published by Erdman's. How long were you working on this project? Could you share a little bit about the process? You could go all the way back to 2005. I mean, I, I didn't start writing it then. But um, in 2005, I started research on the Gospel of Thomas. And that was interrupted a little bit in 2006 when the Gospel of Judas was uh, released. Uh, The manuscript was sort of unveiled to the public then and Mm. uh, the text was was made available in photographs. So I sort of had a little detour then and wrote a, a short book on the Gospel of Judas and then working on other things like atonement and you know, publishing two books on the Gospel of Thomas, I finally, in about 2015, started writing this this larger book, which was is not a not like the other ones, a sort of you know a single book on a single apocryphal gospel, but is an attempt to survey the whole field of early Christian gospels, both mm-hmm. canonical and non-canonical. And so, it really over the last five or six years is when I've been focused on specifically writing this book. So it took a long time, a lot of work. Th- this book is really ha- has a lot to do with these other Gospels uh, that didn't make it into the New Testament, if I could put it that way. Outside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just for the listeners who aren't familiar with other Gospels outside of that, what, what, other, what are these Gospels and what are they like? Well, there's a big variety of apocryphal Gospels, and, and actually... Um, Last year, I published a, a translation of over 40 apocryphal Gospels oh, wow. <laughs> uh, in, in the Penguin Classics series. When I say Gospels, you know, using that term broadly, sometimes when we have a fragment of something, you don't really know whether it's a Gospel or a fragment of a sermon or or whatever. But, the, you know, there are a good number of 
gospels that are both referred to in the ancient world and which we have manuscripts of today. So I, I guess some of the best known ones are the Gospel of Philip, uh, which is referred to in the Da Vinci Code, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, uh, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, uh, the Gospel of Peter. Um, so the non-canonical gospels are often given, you know, pseudonymously the names of um, apostles in a similar way to how the the gospels of Matthew and John, for example, are um, are called the gospel according to Matthew and the gospel according to John. What are these gospels like? Well, they're really varied. So if you take a text like the infancy gospel of Thomas, um, not not the same as the gospel, just the gospel of Thomas, there's an infancy gospel as well. That's a series of stories about Jesus' childhood, about how he still had, you know, already had miraculous powers when he was a, a, a boy and he turns bits of clay into birds and he revives one of his friends who doesn't he off. kill him first and then yeah 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 <laughs> that's <revive> right <laughs> um but what, what one of them just falls off a falls off a off a roof um and and so so a text like that the infancy gospel of thomas is not really subversive it's not you know heretical mm. per se it's more like a pious legend whereas other types of gospels are more subversive. So the Gospel of Judas, for example, deliberately sets out to disagree with the the picture in the biblical Gospels. And then in the middle, you've got a text like the Gospel of Philip, which both uses the New Testament Gospels, but also disagrees with them at some points as well. And, and what drew you to work on these Gospels? Because you've spent so much time on them. Someone might ask the question, well, I already have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's the point in spending time on these, uh, what would you say to that kind of question? The non-canonical Gospels are not just big business in scholarship. They're also quite in the air in the public domain. So, for example, Elaine, Elaine Pagels and Bart Ehrman have both written books about the apocryphal Gospels in, um, you know, that have got into the New York Times bestsellers list. Uh, mm. You often find the non-canonical Gospels referred to as a sort of objection to classic christianity you know what about these other what about these other texts you know is it a vatican conspiracy that we only have the four gospels that we have in the bible and did the church set out to sort of burn copies of of the apocryphal gospels uh, don't they have just as much of a claim to be in the bible as as matthew mark luke and john so i, th I think you know for both in scholarship well, you know scholars are interested in absolutely everything but, but i think right. also in the sort of popular sphere they you know, are known about and, but well, they're known about often, but not really known in detail, in any detail. So, you know, some people might know the names of the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Philip, but not really know anything about them. Yeah. It's almost sort of a way to defeat any kind of authority that the biblical Gospels have. Well, you could say, well, well, there are lots of Gospels. Who, who's to say that this, this is correct? At least I've exactly. seen it used yeah. in that yeah. way a little bit. Let's talk about the, the thesis of the book a little bit. Some say that uh, the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not special, as we've just been saying, or authoritative, but merely the ones favored by one group of Christians who managed to seize power and suppress all others. And at least in the States, everyone's obsessed with power today. Truth is, mm -hmm. is terribly out of fashion, mm -hmm. uh, but power is in, and feelings. And uh, so this really kind of sits with the zeitgeist of our own time. Um, how common is this belief that uh, the canonical Gospels are not special? How, how, how common is that in the academy today? Could you give us a sense of the popularity of this idea? I think it is a pretty common idea. I mean, a movement both to rehabilitate the uh, non-canonical Gospels as the sort of underdogs, the victims of history, uh -huh. and to give them you know, the recognition that they perhaps deserve, and at the same time to put all the Gospels on the same level playing field. Yeah, um, they're like so the oppressed minorities. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Scholars are often emphatic about the fact that, you know, there's nothing special about Matthew or John or the Gospel of Philip or the Gospel of Thomas. They're all, all in the same boat, uh, really, for, for scholarly purposes. Would you say that's a majority view today? 
Oh, it's it's always very hard because there are so many scholars in so many different continents. It, um, uh, you, you know, and di of different theological persuasions, it's very difficult to talk about a, mi a minority or majority view. Uh -huh. um, but it's certainly a, a very popular view in certain circles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about the thesis of your book, uh, just briefly. W what would you say the central? Well, I, I guess you have two theses. Uh, so uh, feel free. G give us the book in a nutshell. What were you trying to do here? Sure. Well, maybe it would be useful to, if, I, if I just read out the two theses. Yeah, which, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, 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 based on them, we can kind of get into the detail of them. So thesis one, the four New Testament Gospels share key elements of theological content that mark them out from most of the canonical Gospels. And thesis two, the reason why the New Testament Gospels are theologically similar to one another is that they, unlike most others, follow a pre-existing apostolic creed, inverted commas, or preached gospel. Mm -hmm. So the first thesis is is just a, a sort of an attempt to state a fact about the content of the canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they have a substantial amount of important content in common with one another, which non-canonical gospels tend not to. And the second thesis is really about explaining why that is the case. Uh, and it's not just because, you know, in the fourth century, one group sort of dominated all the others, and that's why they seized on these four Gospels. But it's really actually because before the Gospels were written, there was already a preached Gospel, a proclaimed message, mm -hmm. which shapes decisively what the four New Testament Gospels are like and doesn't. Uh, uh, and certain other, you know, the, the apocryphal Gospels or non-canonical Gospels you know, share some of those, some of the features of that message, some of the features of the gospel, but ignore others or even argue against others. So those are the two, the two main theses, one about content and thesis two explaining why that is the case. Well, let's talk about how others have done this in the past. You mentioned this in, in your introduction a little bit, that uh, they decided to establish authenticity or canonicity on the basis of early composition or how popular the Gospels were, attestation, or uh, the literary type of ancient bi biography, or the attractiveness of that worldview. Why are these ways of establishing the canonical Gospels as, in fact, special? Why did you not go with any of those approaches? You went for theological content instead. Yeah, I mean, I, d I don't disagree with the the attempts to argue that the four canonical gospels are distinctive for you know for other reasons i don't really have anything against those arguments although some of them are, some of them are stronger than others i think what i observed is that no one has really done this before i guess <laughs> um that no one has argued really on the basis of theological content people make passing remarks um about to this effect but it hasn't been there hasn't been a full treatment i don't think comparing the theological content of the four new testament gospels over against the um, non-canonical gospels comparing really i guess how they understand the gospel you know these are all texts which to greater or lesser degrees claim to have the ultimate truth and that's not just true of the canonical gospels but if you take the gospel of thomas for example the gospel of thomas begins these are the secret words which the living jesus spoke and which didymus judas thomas wrote down and whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. So the way to immortality is by finding the sort of key to understanding the mysteries and having the knowledge of the true sayings of Jesus. So all of these gospels are pretty much claiming to contain the absolute truth about Jesus, which results in in salvation, however, that salvation is understood, and you know, they all, they don't all think of salvation in exactly the same way. That's partly why I chose to focus on theological content because that that ultimately is what the texts themselves are about. Yeah, sort of taking them on your own terms. There are some advantages to the strategy that you adopted here, uh, as far as the sort of pre-existence of the charisma to the writing of the Gospels. Um, mm. Let's talk about that a little bit. You call the kerygma a comparator, and you have this comparison language throughout the book. Give us a definition of the kerygma first. Like, what, what does the word kerygma mean? Obviously, that's not an English word, 
Uh, and uh, how did you use that concept throughout the book? Sure. The, the, the word kerygma is a Greek word, and it, it derives from the verb keruso or keruto to proclaim. It's not a special Christian word. It's a, it's a normal word which anyone might use about a message, whether it's a message that the Athenians have won a battle or whether it's a message that Christ has died for your sins. <laughs> so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a word which means uh, a message. And um, Paul uses, you know, words about words connected to it frequently mm -hmm. new testament authors you know often use the, the verb to proclaim uh, and so the kerygma is really a way in which scholars have talked about the original message of the apostles so there have been lots of attempts by scholars to define what the gospel was uh, for the for the early earliest christians and so the, the way i go about this is to find one particular place in paul where paul explicitly states that he is reporting what the gospel is. So in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the um, the gospel by which the Corinthians are saved. And then he goes on to explain what that gospel is, uh, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to various people after that. So, in, so I suppose I focus on what I regard as four central elements in that message namely that that jesus is the christ mm -hmm. the subject of that sentence is the, is christ the messiah um secondly that this christ died for our sins so that there's a saving death that the, the messiah goes through thirdly that there's a re the, the resurrection on the third day is also a key component of the gospel it's not just about jesus death it's all equally about his resurrection as well and finally and fourth, fourthly and finally that this all takes place according to the scriptures so those are the sort of four key elements of the kerygma of the early Christian message that I identify that Jesus is the Christ, saving death, saving resurrection, and all uh, in accordance with the scriptures. And then, then I go on to sort of, sort of explain how this isn't just an eccentric bit of Paul's preaching, mm -hmm. but it's something that's actually shared across the New Testament you know, I could have gone further into the second century and looked at people like Ignatius and the the Ascension of Isaiah and other texts where uh, these four elements are, you know, very prominent. But the other New Testament authors like Hebrews, 1 Peter, Revelation, are all emphatic about the importance of Jesus being Messiah, saving right. death, saving resurrection, all according to the scriptures. So that's how I identify the, the early Christian kerygma. Right. So that's your criteria of, uh, I won't say criteria of authenticity, I'll get myself in trouble with that, but uh, <laughs> that's your criteria of comparison, your comparator. And yeah. uh, you're going to then, throughout the book, measure Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but also these other Gospels. How many other Gospels did you do? Was it like seven? Seven, yeah. Yeah, yeah. seven other Gospels in addition to the four, and measure each up against that kerygma measuring stick, if you will, mm. uh, to see how they how they each do. Uh, now, before we look at your results of this this uh, research, I want to ask you if you've had much pushback on identifying the kerygma as just those four things. Like there are other facts about Jesus contained in the Gospels, like I don't know, an event, say the triumphal entry, or mm -hmm. that he healed people. You know, what, why exclude those? What what was your thinking there in excluding other items that maybe could also be used? Yeah, I, I, I suppose it's partly a practical one. It's partly you know, going with at least one place where uh, an early Christian sets out to explain what what the gospel is in a in a very sort of brief summary fashion. I guess there are lots of things that one could say are true about Jesus but which aren't necessarily good news so, so or, or <laughs> which aren't necessarily the good news right. uh, so the the triumphal entry is is never picked up as far as i know by an early christian author as a kind of saving event right in its in itself um or the feeding of the 5000 you know something that appears yeah. in all four yeah, gospels so, right so yeah the, so the, the, it's it's obviously a very important um, event and I think a lot of the events. In, I mean, I do I do say quite a bit about the events that take place in the Gospels as signs of Jesus' messiahship, as as sort of indicators 
of the kind of messiah that he is. But an event like the, the feeding of the 5,000, important as it is, is never picked up by early Christians as a kind of decisive event which reveals a salvation, which is a saving event for everyone. It was a very important event for those 5,000 people, <laughs> and it was a very important um, event for the gospel writers as a, as a sign, as an indication of the kind of Messiah that Jesus is. But it, it's not given a kind of an, an independent importance uh, as far as salvation is concerned. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, what I hear you saying is, is partly methodological, because finding that little summary, you know, that, that statement in 1 Corinthians 15 is so fascinating. And apologists have, have done so much with that over the years to uh, make the case that that's such an early, early creed that Paul had received and then passed on, and now he's reminding them of it again. And still, 1 Corinthians is, is an incredibly early document. And, yeah. and so, you know, you can backdate that information to uh, probably his time in Jerusalem. Uh, so it's really a fascinating little corner of the, the New Testament to work with uh, as far as a kernel that then is repeated and memorized. And, you know, even just like the formulaic uh, language, especially in the Greek. So, yeah, I, I definitely hear what you're saying there. And then, you know, these other events like his healing ministry or the triumphal entry, they all, they're all occur in service to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. What kind of a Messiah is he? Let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about your, your four <clears throat> components a little bit. <clears throat> How did you go about seeing Jesus as Messiah, especially in, let, let's say, for Mark to, to start? Yeah, well, I, I suppose the first, the first thing to say is that Mark is absolutely emphatic about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, and so it's, it's striking when you compare Mark with some of the apocryphal gospels, like like the Gospel of Judas, to take one example, uh, or even the Gospel of Thomas, where you have gospel texts which don't refer to Jesus as Messiah at all. You know, whereas Mark, you, almost certainly the earliest of the gospels, is emphatic about this fact. You know, the first line of Mark uh, Mark's gospel is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, Christos, the Christ. Well, Chris do because it's in the genitive, but um, um, <laughs> that Jesus is the Messiah in the first line of the book. Right. And then when you get to the middle, you, there aren't masses and masses of references to Jesus as the Messiah, but they do occur in important places like that first line. And then in the Caesar of Philippi incident where Jesus says to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And the answer, which looks very much like the correct answer, you are the Christ, Peter replies. So Mark is really uh, emphatic about the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. It occurs right at the beginning and then at that midpoint. And in terms of the sort of Messiah that Jesus is, one of the things that we 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 see in early Jewish texts, and there are lots of discussions of the Messiah in early Jewish literature, is that the, the definition of a Messiah always comes about by some kind of biblical interpretation. There is, you know, various... Old Testament texts are employed to create a picture of the Messiah, either in anticipation of what the Messiah is going to look like, or in retrospect. So in the case of Simon Bar Kokhba, this happens as well, who was regarded by the Messiah by some of the rabbis, a second century figure who led a revolt against the Rome, Romans in 132 to 135 AD. He, he is called by some a Messiah, and that messianic identity that Simon Bar Kokhba was was given by some is defined in scriptural terms and it's the same with jesus so when we come to the the baptism again you know only a few verses into mark we probably have a reference there to psalm 2 you are my son where as as god says to to jesus and so psalm 2 is the use of psalm 2 immediately triggers the the, the fact that this is the davidic messiah but who has some kind of special relation to God, even beyond being a king. Uh, just as uh, in Psalm 2 is a, a text which is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, the, yeah, which is which is probably what, you know, prompted it to become used in messianic context by the Psalms of Solomon, for example, um, to take one example, a first century BC 
set of psalms, uh, the last two of which are strongly messianic. Yeah, so 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 that's just one example of how Mark uses scripture to define the kind of Messiah that Jesus is. Yeah. L- let me ask you about John for a second, just to mm-hmm. shift gears. Talk to us about how John describes Jesus as Messiah, because John obviously is a little different than the synoptics. And then uh, maybe contrast that with the Gospel of Thomas a little bit on this, sure. on this topic of Jesus as Christ or Messiah. Yeah, that's a good, quite good good way of putting the question, because sometimes scholars say that, well, the synoptics are quite like each other and John and Thomas are quite like yeah. each other. <laughs> but I actually, I, I think the, 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 the real picture is very different. John shares with the synoptics an absolute emphasis on Jesus being Messiah. Mm-hmm. So in John 20, John tells us why he, you know, the purpose of his gospel is, you know, Jesus did many other things that are not written this in this book, but these are written down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So, you know, he's setting out his purpose of writing a gospel for salvation, and the key way of understanding Christ is, understanding Jesus in John is as the Christ, the Son of God. And that sort of those two titles sort of squashed together there. Mm-hmm. So John is absolutely emphatic about Jesus' identity as the as the Christ, and that's very different from the Gospel of Thomas because the Gospel of Thomas doesn't mention the title Christ at all, which is quite surprising, I think, yeah. to to have an early Christian text or a text that purports to be a Christian text which doesn't call Jesus Messiah. Um, but understands Jesus in other terms, like Thomas does use the title Son of God, uh, or not Son of God per se, but, you know, he's the Son of the Father. Again, Thomas doesn't use the whole scriptural framework to explicate the kind of figure that Jesus is. Whereas, again, John understands Jesus' messiahship in terms that are derived from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So one one passage, for example, that John uses is the suffering servant passage, mm-hmm. that Jesus is high and lifted up, just like the servant in Isaiah 52 to 53. And again, Isaiah 53 is a passage which is sometimes used um, before that, it's used in the, um, in the parables of Enoch or the similitudes of Enoch, first century BC, first century AD text, to depict the exaltation of the Messiah. Right. I was I was going to add, push back on that a little bit because um, I think many modern Jews would say, what does Isaiah 52, 53 have to do with being a Messiah? Uh, but there there is evidence that some people did think of the Suffering Servant songs as Messianic texts. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's very strong in the uh, in one Enoch or the similitudes of Enoch. Um, and it's also very strong in the Targum. Uh, of Isaiah, mm-hmm. and I think uh, I think you, you can see quite a lot of ele- elements actually in common between the way Isaiah fifty three is used in the Targum, and that's the um, the Aramaic paraphrase of Isaiah, and one Enoch, which also uses what Isaiah fifty three in a, a strongly messianic fashion. Yeah, I, I really found your approach to talking about Christ fascinating. Not that it was radical or just out of this world or anything, but uh, that the tendency to use Old Testament texts to talk about Messiah and then analyzing which texts that each of the different Gospels used, uh, mm. what did you find in these other Gospels, like uh, Philip or, or Judas or, or whatever? Mm. You know, did, they, did they use Old Testament texts to establish their, the Messianic portrait or identity? Just before I answer, I should credit uh, Matt Novenson with making that point really really clearly in his two books one on christ and the messiah in paul and one on one called the grammar of messianism by matthew novenson he really shows very clearly how important scripture is for the defining the nature of the messiah it's therefore very striking that you know given the fact that in early jewish literature in rabbinic literature in the new testament and other early christian literature you know the scripture is always used to define the Messiah. It's therefore very striking when you come to, to some apocryphal gospels where there's really no reference to scripture at all. So I've mentioned the gospel of Thomas, which doesn't refer to Jesus as Christ. It also has a, quite a negative view of 
what we would call the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Yeah. So the Gospel of Thomas, at one point there's a dialogue, the Gospel of Thomas saying 52, where the disciples ask, were the prophets in Israel prophesying about you? And Jesus replies, you have spoken only about the dead, whereas the living one is standing in front of you. So the prophets are just, you know, the Old Testament authors or the prophets are just characterized as spiritually dead. Dead, dead in the Gospel of Thomas is not just a statement about biology. It's a, a spiritual condition. Um, so the Gospel of Thomas doesn't not only sort of neglects the Old Testament, but actually polemicizes against it. You get a similar polemic against the Old Testament in the Gospel of the Egyptians, where the gospel of the Egyptians reveals the truth which neither the, the preachers nor the apostles nor the prophets knew about. The gospel of Judas defines Jesus in terms which have nothing to do with the Old Testament. The gospel of truth, again, hardly refers to the Old Testament. It you know, has one possible allusion to the Old Testament, but not really in a, as a description of Jesus. And what, I suppose one of the, one of the most um, striking cases of this is Marcion's gospel. Marcion is quite a well-known Christian heretic in, in scholarly circles. And you sometimes find a slight misrepresentation of Marcion, that Marcion was not interested in the Old Testament. Marcion was actually really interested in the Old Testament, but he regarded the, the Old Testament as telling a story of a different God from the God of Jesus. So Marcion actually thinks that there are two messiahs, one who's it gets the complicated. <laughs> yeah, it gets complicated. One who's the Messiah of the Creator God, the Jewish Messiah, who's going to come and restore uh, the twelve tribes of Israel, and then there's Jesus, who has nothing to do with the Old Testament. The the Jesus who comes in the New Testament or in his in his gospel, you know, just comes out of clear blue sky. It's self interpreting rather than to be interpreted in terms of the Old Testament, and he's actually he's actually acting in opposition to the creator God in the course of the gospel narrative. So we, we've got you know, various different ways in which the Old Testament is treated. The gospel of truth pretty much ignores the Old Testament all the, altogether. The gospel of the Egyptians and the gospel of Thomas sort of polemicize against the Old Testament. Uh, Marcion has a com completely different take on it. Right, right. He's, he's a little more sci-fi. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always uh, think of like the the Gnostics, which uh, I'm not saying Marcion's a Gnostic, but you know the later uh, like Sethian Gnostics and stuff is is uh, like sci-fi novels with too many characters to keep track yeah. of, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I don't I don't think we'll have time to go thoroughly into all the all the four components here because you know the the book is dense. People should buy it if they want to know more about it, right? But you talk about the vicarious death of Jesus, establish the case uh, very easily, I think, that uh, the canonical Gospels do make this uh, a big part mm -hmm. of their description of, of Jesus, not just uh, about him in general, but narrating the rest, trial, crucifixion of Jesus, and so on, mm -hmm. and, so on and so forth. And, you know, John, of course, gets a little more flowery, uh, because we have, uh, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I mean, right up front. Uh, yeah. So John John is not going in a, a Gnostic or an anti-realist or docetic direction, uh, no. as, as no. some have uh, accused in the past. He's right in line. And then you talk about the resurrection and then the fulfillment of Scripture, as you were kind of merging the, the the one about Christ and the fulfillment of Scripture together there, which I think is great because, you know, he's he's Christ according to the Scriptures. He's died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was raised from the dead according to the Scriptures, yeah. you know, in 1 Corinthians 15 there. So I think it's that's totally fair. You're able to make this case about these four Gospels in particular being special was there anything that surprised you in doing this research as far as the non-canonical Gospels on these four points? Yeah, I, I think one thing which I hadn't really appreciated when I first went into this was that that some of the apocryphal Gospels are actually quite interested in, in Jesus' death as a saving event. Mm -hmm. You know, I suppose you can have a caricature of, of, of apocryphal Gospels in which Jesus is not not a physical being he's just a disembodied spirit which is you know is the case in some in some uh, 
of the more obscure texts. This is the case, for example, in the Gospel of Judas. But in the in in the um, Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of of Truth, for example, those two two texts are both very strong on the fact that Jesus' death is a saving event. Mm -hmm. They don't belong to the sort of hard hardcore Gnostic, the Sethian Gnostics or the classical Gnostic mm -hmm. sects, um, but they owe their sort of theology to uh, a teacher called Valentinus. And Valentinus didn't have a kind of very strict dichotomy or dualism between mater matter and um, between sort of material flesh and spirit. Uh, he thought that matter was, you know, an illusion of some kind, but he didn't regard it as completely evil in the way that um, the sort of proper Gnostics did. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Jesus really took on a body. He really died. And through the process of, of, of that death, he revealed the truth of the cosmos to, um, to his followers. And in the destruction of his flesh, the illusion of the, of the cosmos is shattered. And so, uh, in the gospel of truth, there's, you know, pretty strong emphasis on Jesus' death as saving. I, I, I'd say the same thing, I think, as well with Marcion's gospel. It's a bit hard with Marcion's gospel because it's reconstructed. And so, we don't always know exactly what Marcion says, but uh, elsewhere reports about Marcion are very strong about the fact that Marcion loves Galatians, right? You know, Galatians is Marci is is almost more important than the gospel for than the gospel text for Marcion. And in Galatians three, of course, we have Christ redeem redeeming us. Marcion is very interested in the fact that Christ's death is a kind of purchase of human souls from the Creator God. That I think flows over into the gospel text because, you know, just as the you know, Marcion's gospel is a kind of synoptic gospel based on the gospel of Luke, and he retains from Luke the the idea that Jesus' flesh and blood are given for his followers as an institution of the covenant. Um, so, so, so Marcion too is is also interested in the fact that you know, despite his funny theology of Jesus being Messiah, you know, two messiahs and mm -hmm hostility to the creator god he is quite strong on the fact that christ's death is a saving event yeah so that, yeah that, that's one of the main things i think that i learned as i was going through yeah you, you might maybe have been expecting these other gospels to just totally disregard the death of christ uh -huh. and in, in fact some of them made a big deal about it so that's yeah so, so yeah that's I, interesting I, so, my book is my book certainly isn't arguing that you know the gospel the four canonical gospels have the full blown charisma and all the other gospels don't have any of it you know it's, the argument isn't like that at all it's it's much more much more nuanced than that yeah let me ask you about the reception of of this book so far certainly evangelicals are very excited to have this book and you know it's it's defending the biblical gospels. So uh, let's just kind of set them to the side. They're going to like it anyhow. We already know that. What about in the academy? What about among more critical and skeptical scholars? How have they pushed back? How have they received the book? Or is it just too early to tell right now? Yeah, it's, it, the book's only just come out actually last month. So I think it, it, you, it'll be over the next year or, or even two that reviews come out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I mean, I, I, I deliberately set out, you know, not just to get evangelical scholars to write the blurb on the back of the book. So there, are, you know, there are very sort of mainstream figures like Jörg Frey, uh, Jens Schröter, who who are evangelish but not evangelical, if you know what I mean. They're probably yeah. who are Protestant but not evangelical. Um, also, Sandra Hubenthal, who's a Catholic. I hope the book will not just be written for one tribe, uh, but will gather sort of scholarly attention more broadly yeah well i i know that there are going to be some scholars coming after you for this oh uh, sure because yeah, yeah. i mean you you <laughs> you definitely took on you know like bart ehrman is is such a sensationalist he's just so good at selling books this is really a corrective to his extremist position on these other gospels as being perfectly equivalent uh even my in my own education at boston university i um i think the name of the one of my classes was varieties of early christianity and it, it was just like taken for granted that all of the different versions of christianity are completely equivalent and one should not be privileged over the other because they yeah. ended up becoming more popular later on 
And, you know, I, I think there is some value to that, uh, to yeah. looking at, you think of like Rome in the second century, you've got Justin Martyr, Valentinus, you've got, you know, all these different positions and perspectives uh, that are all in the same city at the same time. And, yeah. you know, they don't have some big institution to clobber each other. You know, they have to just use persuasion, right? Yeah. I think that's fine. But then uh, I think to say all Gospels are equivalently valid for historical sources, now I'm going to have a problem, you know, because uh, some of them do seem really unreliable historically or late or exaggerated mm-hmm. or obviously subject to just uh, a, a strong agenda mm-hmm. or, or theology that's, that's coloring things. So I, I think your work here is really, really does provide that, I don't know if I would call it objective, but s- some sort of like really measurable way of classifying these four Gospels mm-hmm. as, as unique uh, mm-hmm. among, you know, what'd you say, 40 in your recent translation? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that's, that's a huge number, and those are those are the ones we know. There could be even more that didn't yeah. survive. So uh, I really appreciate what you're what you're doing here. What would you hope to see as far as an impact of the book in academic circles and in universities? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I suppose in some ways it's maybe unrealistic for any scholar to expect to persuade his you, you know his own colleagues and um because you know by the time you get to to middle age you're fairly sort of set in your mental pathways and um but i but i certainly hope it would provide a platform you know for i was going to say the next generation but you know the next generation of scholars is you know a generation of scholars is like probably 10 years because <laughs> you know we we uh I, I, my phd students are not much younger than than i am uh, um so, so I certainly hope that you know the next round of scholarship over the next ten or twenty years might be more open to the idea that uh, the four gospels are uh, are theologically distinctive. Yeah. What would you say to somebody who asks the question, "Well, what do I need to know any of this for? I, I already believe in the Bible. What's the point in engaging in this kind of uh, research?" Well, I think for for ordinary Christians, unless you live in a kind of Christian enclave. You're going to come up against, you know, lots of arguments about Mm -hmm. lots of anti-Christian arguments, aren't you? Whether it's, you know, how can God God be omnipotent and all loving but allow suffering? Doesn't science, you know, give a more compelling explanation of of our origins than the Book of Genesis? You know, lot lots of lots of Christians encounter all the time uh, objections to Christianity, And, and one of them, one of them that I've come across a lot is that. The, the Bible is is basically a kind of arbitrary collection of texts um, that are put in place as you uh, you know as you implied at, at the beginning by a powerful ecclesiastical elite who sought to suppress all other forms of Christianity. I suppose this you know one thing one knock and effect for ordinary Christians I think is to show that the the four Gospels aren't simply you know canonical because of power relations but because they have a genuine claim to go back to the original theology of the apostles and therefore of jesus himself so that that i think is why having at least some knowledge i mean i'm not saying every christian should read this book by any means um i wouldn't inflict that on on anyone let alone everyone um but um to have some not have some sort of basic knowledge of what's going on in the apocryphal gospels is useful just as just as having some basic knowledge of science is useful if you're if you're responding to objections about um, uh, objections to Christianity on a scientific basis. Yeah, I think if you're a Christian who's taking your faith seriously, you have some responsibility for the Great Commission and yeah. reaching people, making disciples in, you know, certainly in my neck of the woods, which is probably pretty similar to where you are. Mm. Uh, I live in a very post-Christian ar- area. Um, we, the the upstate New York area is where I live near Albany, and um, it's been identified by Barna as the most post-Christian uh, city in the United States. So I thought wow. to myself, wow, what a great place to be a pastor. Yeah, uh, but I was going to say congratulations, but I'm not sure if that's <laughs> yeah. the right word. <laughs> yeah, still, like, it, it looks like the Bible Belt compared to England. So, uh, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, I thought, you know, what a great place to be a pastor. But at the same time, it does take more effort 
Mm. Because when you when you encounter people, everything is up for grabs, and everyone has kind of a Hollywood impression of the Bible or of we mentioned the Da Vinci Code. People have this sense, like you said, that oh yeah, there are other gospels too. Who's to say that this collection of four is legitimate? So uh, I really appreciate your approach. I think it's really compelling for a non-believer to ask the question. Well, as a historian. You know, even just starting with that phrase, as a historian, uh, what we can gather from the earliest Christians is that they believed, whether it's true or not, they believed Jesus is the Messiah or Jesus is the Christ. He died for their sins. He was raised from the dead. And, you know, they had this this idea about dependence on the Hebrew Bible or on, on the Septuagint, at least, you know, the, the scriptures. And, you know, you can establish that in, in just a conversation with somebody pretty easily Mm. And uh, say, now, when we come to these, all, all these different Gospels, you know, all in, let's say, 40, uh, which one of these line up with the earliest information we have about the proclamation of Jesus mm. or about Jesus, right? Uh, so, you know, I think, it is a, I think it is a compelling strategy, and so I, I appreciate you, uh, you bringing that. Do you already have an idea of, of what's next for you, or are you just sort of basking in the, uh, the post-publishing <laughs> glory here? Yeah, just just to pick up on what you just said, but before I before I answer sure. the question, all right, I, I'm 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 really glad about that because I, I I guess there's a responsibility for for pastors, you know, to yeah. to set aside the time to to read a book like this, you know, even if not every not every I don't mean every pastor should read it, but I'm I'm glad that I'm really glad that you've read it because you you can then equip others to be able to answer these objections. You know, ordinary Christians won't, won't necessarily have the the time or the expertise to get into it. Um, in terms of in terms of the next project, yeah, I, I've I've got a sabbatical now to try and work out what to do next, and I'm probably going to do something on the question of how much Jesus and the New Testament authors thought that the end was imminent. Oh, which oh, is that which would be great. That I've often puzzled over and would like to find the answer to. So oh, that's another <laughs> that's another Aramin uh, hobby horse right there. <laughs> Not just him either. Uh, there's no, it's it's a very dominant the, the whole the whole stream, you know, from uh, uh, Schweitzer uh, yeah. forward. Wow, that would be great. You know, how, did did he really think it was the end? Did he think it was him him being present? You know, what does it mean at hand there when he proclaims <laughs> about the kingdom? Yeah, that'd be yeah. that'd be a fascinating work. Uh, work. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Where can people go to find out more about you and about the book? Well, I mean, the book you can just get on Amazon, The Gospel and the Gospels. Also, the other book um, I mentioned, The Apocryphal Gospels. Oh, ah, yeah. Um, which is... How, um, how many pages is that one? Sure. Well, this is, it's, uh, it's about 400 pages, but it's very cheap as well it's like ten dollars on amazon um or or from barnes and noble or or wherever you buy your books um and this is this is the translation of all all the 40 gospels i mentioned earlier um so although it's 400 pages you can just dip in and out and you know read little bits of it at a time in a way that you you know is a bit more difficult with with this one (laughs) yeah yeah all right well uh thanks so much for talking with me today thanks thanks for having me Sean. well this brings our interview to a close what did you think you have any questions, thoughts, would love to hear your feedback. You can provide that at restitutio.org. It's the word restitution with no N, dot O-R-G. You can find episode 461, The Gospel and the Gospels, with Simon Gathercole, and leave your comments there. would love to see what you have to say about Gathercole's approach and whether you think it will be helpful. As far as our Scripture and Science series, we'll be getting back to that next week. In fact, our teacher for that class uh, has just had a child. So congratulations, uh, Will Barlow and Becca Barlow, for adding a new member to your family. Uh, It's really great. That's such a cool experience and such a wonderful journey to be on. Hopefully he'll be back next week, and we'll be able to continue in that series and consider some of the some more options on interpreting Genesis 1. We've already looked at a couple of varieties of young earth creationism. In our next episode, we're going to look at day-age theories, including the standard approach, a modified version of day-age, and a relativistic day-age, as well as a theistic evolutionary perspective, 
uh, before in future episodes considering John Walton's temple hypothesis in our quest to get all the options on the table and be informed about how we can read Genesis 1 in a fruitful and responsible and authentic way. Well, that's it for today. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can do that at our website, restitutio.org. We'll catch you next time. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.